All right, guys, we're back for some more of the house in Fata Morgana. Thank you again for all the love and support you give this series, guys, as usual. And always, I appreciate it much. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so currently, we are pretty much learning about the witch's tale, or her origins for that matter. And like all the other stories we've been uh, exposed to, it has the pattern of bitter tragedy. And it goes without saying that... Ah, oh, it's much. But if it wasn't for that, the stories wouldn't be interesting. And it's exactly why I love this game so much because it's just, I'm always coming back to it because I want to know what happens next. So I'm hoping that we get a just ending for Mikkel and Giselle down the line. Maybe even for the witch. I don't know yet because she's still pretty vicious if you ask me. So if anything else, guys, I hope you all continue to enjoy watching. Now let's get to it. Alright everyone, we are back to the story about the witch. I was delivered to the lavishly decorated mansion of the region's lord. Brightly colored flowers bloomed wildly in the garden as guests laughed and ate extravagant meals. And in addition to them, there were probably four times as many slaves moving about the grounds. Getting a range of looks from everyone we passed, from smartly dressed men to scrawny emaciated servants, I was led to the lord's chambers. The Lord was surrounded by beautiful women. Perhaps they were slaves, or perhaps they were prostitutes, I couldn't tell. Among them were some girls hardly older than me. They all wore thin swathes of cloth, barely covering themselves at all. The Lord looked me up and down, and with a laugh, he said, Welcome, daughter of God. You'll be performing miracles for me now. Miracles are not something to be performed for one single person's benefit. I replied, shocked and furious, he had just said something so utterly blasphemous. In response, he said, I bought you. You are my property. You have no right to an opinion. But I would not have any of it. I entreated him to give up his indulgent lifestyle and devote himself to the service of the Lord. But the more I pleaded, the deeper the creases on his face grew. Thinking back on it now, it was hardly surprising. A nine-year-old girl was scolding the most powerful man in the region. I believed it was my duty and that I was only doing what was right, but he surely saw it as an incredible arrogance. You mean besides the king himself? So the Lord forced his will upon me. He bound my hands and feet and cut me without my permission, filling a goblet with my blood and passing it around to his guests. A saint's blood and good fortune to all. That's gross, man. That was when I realized the Lord was only interested in the approval of others. He reveled in their envy as he pranced about showing off his curious new toy. Me. He didn't need my miracles. Neither he nor any of his guests were afflicted with disease or misfortune. They were all richly blessed. Every time he threw a banquet, he drained me of my blood. It became nearly impossible to find a spot on either of my arms that wasn't swollen reddish back oh, black gash. And soon, because my arms weren't providing enough blood for him, the cutting spread to my legs. I lived in a haze of half-consciousness. Honestly, I'm amazed it didn't kill me, though perhaps the Lord was simply taking care not to take more than my body could spare. Watching the wealthy partygoers laugh and sip my blood through bleary eyes, another wave of despair came over me. My miracles, my blood, were not meant to be an appetizer at a feast. They were meant for the sick and the poor. But despite my wishes, the Lord persisted to squeeze me dry, day in and day out, for his own enjoyment. For a while, I was convinced it was all God's test, that it was part of his plan for me, his daughter, that if I could make it through this trial, I would be allowed to go back to helping people. That man would celebrate my success, envy me, worship me, that sinners would face punishment, that divine retribution would be delivered onto all who had wronged me, a saint. Each passing day, my spirit grew more twisted. Would anyone have believed that guard and bloody girl tied up on the floor in the banquet hall was a saint? Unlikely. This was no charitable gathering, but on a holy Sabbath. Perhaps it was caused by my corrupted spirit. Perhaps it was my heart's way of crying for help. Or perhaps it was the devil giving me my witch's mark. But no matter what the cause, during one of the bloody banquets, I underwent a transformation. I was half conscious as usual, when one of the guests pointed at me and shouted something. His face went pale as if he were afraid, which I found quite curious. 
The Lord then approached me, grabbing me by the hair and lifting my head. He yelled something, but I was too far gone to be able to make out what he was saying. Suddenly, I found myself released from my bonds. But my body had grown so weak from being tied up for so long, I didn't have the strength to hold myself up. And so I collapsed at the floor. I was still trying to figure out what was happening when the Lord drew a sword, raising it high above his head. His words in that moment reached me with perfect clarity. You're a damn witch wearing a saint's skin. A witch? Why was he calling me a witch? I was the, only, I was the holy daughter of God. I had certainly never made a pact to the devil. What could have given him that idea? What was in store for me now? Had God performed some kind of miracle for him? Dozens of thoughts and questions floated through my mind as death hung over me. I couldn't comprehend anything, and so I didn't feel any fear or anger at my impending death. I was simply curious. What had happened to me? But before I had the chance to find that answer, the Lord swung down his blade. You lived a short life. <laughs> that really sucked. Without warning, without any time to prepare, the darkness drains away. And a second later, I crash into the stairs. Hard. <laughs> ah, God. ah! Right in my ear, I can hear the sss of the river of blood. The world fades in and out of view, giving way to a very real images of a past I never lived. I can practically feel the fire in the eyes of that mad blood banquet's guests. My vision distorts. I can't regain my focus. Where blood is, this streaming down the stairs. Oh, sorry. Whose blood? Is it hers? Is it mine? Who am I? A saint? A witch? Is what I'm seeing through a lens of clarity or madness? Wait, no. No. I am not her. I am Mikkel. No one else. It hurts, doesn't it? It's hard to breathe. Your chest is on fire. Your vision is blurry. It's dark. It's lonely. It's scary. It's frustrating. It's disheartening. It's exasperating, isn't it? What you're feeling is exactly the pain I felt. Ah, ah, ah. I reach, out, I reach my hand out and plead for help which is when I see something I can hardly believe. Oh, his own hand is feeling the same pain. Both of my arms are covered in gashes, blood flowing from them without end. The raw flesh beneath my skin has been exposed to the open air. Ah, ah, ah! All I can bring myself to do is scream. That pain, her horrible past, is doing everything in its power to break me. That nine-year-old girl's sickening experience are twisting and constricting and cr crushing me Wh why is this happening to you are you really that slow my dear you're empathizing with my pain you're just that kind hearted Mikkel ah gah. you said you wouldn't give up didn't you that you would make your way to me then surely this won't be enough to do you in ah uh, of course it won't. <laughs> Mustering up every last bit of strength I can, I begin crawling up the stairs. The Red River beats against my open wounds, stinging painfully. Simple act of lifting an arm or a leg is almost unbearably agonizing. The blood dripping from my lacerated arms mixes with the blood already soaking the tower. So this is the pain Morgana suffered. Ugh. <sighs> Do you despise everyone, Morgana? Did your resentment at your mother's betrayal, at the people who came seeking your blood, at the lord who took your life, turn into a hatred for all of mankind? Your perception of me is still incorrect, Mikhail. My grudge is only against a select few. Think about it, my dear. Of the thousands, millions, billions of people living on this planet, my world is comprised of but a minuscule fraction of that. Hatred for all mankind? No, what I feel is not nearly so nebulous. Although, if I had died still believing I was a saint, maybe I wouldn't have such a well-defined mission. Are you saying the Lord didn't kill you? 
Oh my, did you actually think that was the end of my tale? <laughs> Despite your big talk, you're afraid of having to suffer through any more of that, aren't you? But you're the one who said you wouldn't give in. So go on. Know my pain. Without losing your mind. I guess we're gonna go with more- I guess we're gonna learn more of the story after all because I thought we were done. I was about to say, she lived a short life. Ah. Once again, my surroundings crumble. I have no say. I have no chance to object before I'm dragged back to that repulsive banquet. I reach out stretching my hand as far as it will reach, but all I can grab is darkness. My bloody body sinks back into the abyss. The pain becomes more than just a memory, eroding away at my consciousness. You're a damn witch wearing a saint's skin. Maybe if I had died then, I wouldn't have become the witch you know now. But that's all conjecture. Theorizing about what could have happened is an exercise in futility. But no, I did not die that day. Brought together by constant mistreatment, the Lord's slaves chose that moment to start their revolt. When he swung down his blade, someone bumped into him and it was knocked off its course. I didn't have the strength to get to my feet, so I simply watched the chaos unfold before my hazy eyes. It never even occurred to me that I should try to escape. At some point during the riot, a young man, one of the slaves, grabbed me by my bloody limp arm and led me out of the Lord's Manor. The young man brought me to a slum, a place where the people banded together in their hardship, barely scraping together enough to eat every day, let alone pay the taxes demanded of them. By the time we had arrived at a small brothel located a ways into the slum, the fog was starting to clear from my mind. I knew where we were, and feeling the gazes of those scantily clothed women, I trembled. In a sense, that was possibly the most frightened I had ever been in my life, despite everything else I had been through. The idea that I had fallen so far I would have to become a prostitute scared me to death. After all, I was a saint, and saints were supposed to retain their purity. Spreading my legs for any man who gave me enough coins would shatter my very identity. As all that was going through my mind, I probably shouted NO in protest, because the slave gave me an exasperated look and told me he hadn't brought me here to become a prostitute. He said he knew someone here, someone I could trust, and that she would give me a room. I had trouble believing him though. I, could trust the word of, I couldn't trust the word of a prostitute, someone who val valued money more than her own body. It was all a trap, I was sure. One day, they would tell me I had to work. Nothing he said would convince me otherwise. Apparently, sensing my mistrust, the slave gave me an apologetic frown and handed me a mirror saying, even if I did, you couldn't get any work looking like that. I could not believe what I saw. That couldn't be my face. It had to be an illusion. There was no way. That was not the face of a saint. It couldn't be. It wasn't real. It wasn't possible. Patches of skin had fallen off my face, exposing the raw red flesh beneath. It looked quite similar to what had been done to my arms and legs, except my face had never been cut before. Looking at myself in the mirror, even I doubted my own sainthood. The thing in my reflection was a hellish abomination. It was the twisted face of a witch. And although I was shocked by what I saw, at the same time, it answered several lingering questions. It explained why the Lord and his guests had panicked at the sight of me. And it also explained why he had said I was a witch wearing a saint's skin. Over the course of the dozens of banquets I had participated in, my face must have mutated, twisted into this ugly, sickening, monstrous thing. The sight of what I had become sapped the last bit of willpower from me. Not because I was particularly fond of my face or thought myself especially beautiful, but because it crushed me to see everything saintly about me crumble away. Tests from God or otherwise, I didn't have the strength left to attempt to overcome it. Deciding I would rather be dead than struggle any longer, I begged the slave to kill me. Taking one's own life was a sin. If I did that, I would not be able to return to my father's side, and I wanted to ask him why I had been put through such tribulation. But the young man refused. He said completely missing my intention that if I persevered, good fortune would eventually find me. He said that if I lived on, I would eventually have a chance to get my payback. I had no such worldly concerns though, but if one would take my life, I had no choice but to live. I despised life at the brothel. The men who came to buy their services were disgusting buffoons. The kind of people who think, who would think they could deceive God. And the women fawning over them were just as repulsive. That said, I had nowhere else to go. 
which meant I was forced to suffer that sickening place. But by the time a year or so had passed, my feelings about it had changed. The women at the brothel took good care of me, treating me like a sister. At first, it was just irritating. I was a saint. And how could a saint have prostitutes for sisters? But over time, I got to know them better, grew to appreciate their circumstances and hardships. Despite barely having enough money to keep food on the table, whenever they had little to spare, they would use it to purchase medicine. Ointment still applied to my arms, legs, and face. And as a result of their generosity, my arms and legs started looking almost human, but nothing had any effect on my face. Occasionally, the slave would drop in to check in on me. The other men thought me ghastly and wouldn't get anywhere near me, but he was different. And every time he visited, he would say, One day, I'll show you the world. And to tell you the truth, I was beginning to grow attached to it all. My time at the brothel was probably, all things considered, one of the brighter chapters of my life. There, I was neither saint nor witch, but an ordinary human girl. For the first time, I felt like my life had meaning beyond my assumed divine purpose. I was even beginning to feel kind of happy. And with each passing day, my intractable worldview was gaining a little flexibility. Perhaps I could perform miracles. But that didn't necessarily mean I had to be the daughter of God or a saint. Maybe I was just a regular person who happened to possess some unusual abilities. Ridiculous, isn't it? Despite coming to accept my humanity, I refused to let go of my miraculous powers. They were the last thing protecting what I thought of as myself. But to me, at the time, it felt like a very dramatic change of heart. Three years after the revolt of the Lord, at the Lord's Manor, I had my 12th birthday for which they threw me a little dinner party. The women all pitched in to bake me treats, and the young slave man was there too. I was happy. I thought that if life could continue on like this, I was fine with not having, with not going back to being a saint. But for some reason, for some reason, happiness always seems to slip away as soon as you've got your hands around it. No one sincerely wants to lose it, so why must they? I certainly didn't mind not being miserable. Let me tell you what happened that night. On the night of my birthday celebration, bandits attacked the brothel. Now, bandits were hardly a rarity in that time, so everyone was always on the lookout, and we never went out at night. They wouldn't stop it. They wouldn't stop at rob robbing you either. They were armed with blades and would frequently kill their targets if necessary. But cautious as we were, we were helpless against a direct raid. The brothel fell into a panic, screams echoing in the night. The customers were carved up and left for dead. The women were bound and stowed away to be sold. My peaceful world shattered in an instant. And the next thing I knew, I was some slave, tra slave trader's merchandise. I don't know what became of the prostitutes who cared for me or the slave who brought me to them. I assumed the women were sold and the young man slaughtered. But regardless, I found myself being rocked around in the back of a carriage once more. The carriage was packed so tight you could barely see the floor, and it smelled like death. Sweat, urine, feces, every foul odor, odor imaginable compressed into a tiny space. Man, she's really having like the worst kind of luck. There were both men and women there, nearly all of them muttering or groaning or weeping. Everyone was young, ripe to be put to work. It didn't take me long to realize what fate awaited these people, and me. And when I did, I just sat there in silence. Then, for the first time, I cried. I was experiencing, I believe, a very human emotion. I was sad, hurt that I had been taken away from the place where I was happy, from the women at the brothel and that young man. It crushed me. And no longer did I wonder why such a thing was happening to the holy daughter of God. Something about my tears must have seemed strange to him because one man saw me and said, why are you crying? He was a curious man. To start, he looked very different from anyone else. The color of his skin, the length of his nose, the shape of his eyes. Everything about him was new and unusual. Hesitantly, I replied. I'm sad because I didn't get the chance to show my gratitude to people very dear to me. The man fell silent, looking as though he was in deep thought. I had no idea why he had asked me that, but something about him made me uncomfortable, so I couldn't bring myself to ask. Several hours later, the man suddenly stood up. The guards had no patience for anyone stepping out of line, and they didn't look like they would hesitate to kill us either. So unsurprisingly, one at, the, one at the back of the carriage drew his sword and pointed it at the man. What was surprising though, was what happened next. The man, his hands shackled like the rest of us, leapt for the guard, slamming his fist into his face and stealing his sword. The entire carriage was in shock. The guards were too stunned to effectively react, so they were quickly cut down. 
and because the one-man uprising had taken place between cities, there was no one the slave traders could ask for help before they were slaughtered. In the blink of an eye, it was all over, and there was nothing human about what I had witnessed. If I had to describe it, I would say it was as though a wild beast had attacked. The man ruffled through the slave trader's clothes until he found the keys, which he brought to me, ordering I unshackle him. And so I did, as he, com as he commanded. Once they had enough time to process what had happened, the would-be slaves applauded. Their wretched souls had been saved. And for a moment, I believed so too. When the man's hands were free, he rolled his shoulders a couple of times, made sure everything was in place. And then, he began his massacre. Screams of agony filled the carriage as he ran his sword through the helpless men and women packed inside it. Wow! He was, he was probably jealous that everyone else got to do it but him. <laughs> Blood and guts were splattered against every surface, and those who tried to escape did not get far before being mercilessly skewered. It was like a scene out of a nightmare. I was frozen in place. Not out of fear, but because my mind had shut down. I couldn't make sense of what was happening, so my mind rejected it. And with my brain having given up, my body was no more than a lifeless puppet. In short order, all the slaves were dead, and I was sitting in a pool of blood staring at the man. He pointed his blade at me with a little smirk said, Why didn't you run? In turn, I asked him, Why did you kill them? The smile vanished from his face, and after a few quiet moments of pondering, he replied, Because I felt like it. And why haven't you killed me yet? I asked. To which he gave a curt, I don't know then withdrew his blade and wandered off into the distance. And then, I was all alone, surrounded by corpses. I glanced down, and half of someone's face was looking back up at me. Wrapped in absolute darkness, warm blood spills onto my cheeks, my hair, my skin. Chunks of human flesh rained down on me. Ah! Make it stop! Pitter-patter, pitter-patter. There's no end to the deluge. The smell of death fills the air. Ugh. 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 I'm struck with a wave of nausea so strong I can't hold back the contents of my stomach. But when my mouth opens to vomit, blood pours into it. Ugh. 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 Let go of me! Dead bodies grab at my ankles, dragging me down. To where? Hell? Or to the mountain of corpses? Now do you understand that there was a time? If but briefly when I was happy? When I felt human emotions? But I wish I never had. If I had remained confined in my daughter of God's shell, then I doubt I would have felt so much terror at the sight of death. I can't say anything in response. I can't form words. I feel what she experienced, the massacre she witnessed, the limp flesh piling up around her. Even more than twice her age, it's enough to drive me mad. The fact that... The fact that a 12-year-old girl had to experience something so unspeakable... Devastates me. Tell me, my dear. Do you pity me? Do you sympathize with me? If you feel bad for me, then you'll remain with me. You'll feel my pain and my despair with me. Won't you? <laughs> the witch's cackle echoes through the pile of bodies. There's not a speck of light, and hideous death lingers everywhere. Helpless to resist, I'm dragged down to a deep, dark ocean. An ocean of blood. Now, on with the story. I was at a complete loss for some time after that. I didn't want to return to the city because I knew there was no one left who would take me in. There was only the Lord who had bound me and drained me of my blood. So I wandered the roads, no destination in mind, and nothing to defend myself but the clothes on my back. Frankly, I'm rather surprised I wasn't attacked by bandits. After walking for days without food or water, my mind was hazy and my exhaustion at a peak. In the distance, I saw a lake. So driven by my thirst, I turned my unsteady feet toward the water, not caring that it took me off the main road. 
and it turned out that it was the correct choice because there was a small cottage beside the lake. Smoke rising from the chimney telling me it wasn't abandoned. Out of sheer desperation, I knocked on the door. No one answered. The door wasn't locked, so I slowly, hesitantly pushed it open. And beyond it, I found an old woman sitting dead in a chair. The woman was a witch. By trade, that is. It appeared she had had a deep knowledge of medicinal herbs, using it to make an assortment of me medicines. In her cabinets were dozens of small glass bottles containing dried powdered leaves and crushed berries, among other things. On the fire was a cauldron, liquid bubbling inside. The woman looked as though she was asleep. Presumably, she had passed away of old age, for there was no sign bandits had been rooting through the cottage, and she had looked with absolute serenity on her face. Looking over at the woman's dead body, I didn't cross myself. I envied her. Dragging the woman's body by her feet, I dumped her into the lake. Do you think doing so makes me a bad person? Makes me unsaintly? Well, I didn't have anywhere else to go, and the owner of the cozy cottage was no longer of this world. There was no reason I couldn't build a home in her stead, was there? I deserved to have somewhere I felt comfortable, after everything I'd been through, didn't I? And so I took up residence in the old witch's cottage, and I remained there until my 16th year. By 16, a terrible cynicism had taken root in my heart. I had no trust for people. I shut them out, building high walls around myself. After such a tumultuous, bloody childhood, it was all I could do to protect myself, to keep my young spirit from cracking. Nevertheless, travelers would, on occasion, pay the old witch's cottage a visit, seeking her medicines. Whenever someone arrived, I would cautiously crack the door open, telling them they could trade for whatever they wanted with food and never showing my face. One day, a young man showed up at the cottage. My sister has fallen very ill and she desperately needs medicine. He was, a very, so he was very soft spoken. There was a distinct kindness in his voice which I thought unusual. Curious. What kind of person could he be? What did he look like? What expressions did he make as he spoke? To satisfy that curiosity, I stuck a peek at him through the crack in the door. He was a handsome young man with flowing flaxen hair. And upon seeing me, he didn't flinch back in disgust. He smiled. According to him, his younger sister had fallen gravely ill, and though they had tried a number of remedies, she, had, she was still bedridden. The medicines I gave him too had no effect, but he persisted in his quest, visiting me again and again for new combinations to try. He wanted nothing more than to relieve even the slightest bit of his sister's suffering. And moved by his dedication to his family, I too wanted to do anything I could to help. For the first time in years, my world encompassed more than my small cottage. When the young man came, he would ask not only for medicine, but to go on walks with me. He volunteered to spend time with me, despite my horrifying appearance. It's not healthy to stay holed up inside all the time. You've got this beautiful lake right here. Do you say we take a little walk around the shoreline? He said with a smile, taking me by the hand. We spoke as we circled the lakeside. His voice was always soft and pleasant, like a ray of light shining through a crack in the walls. When I was with him, I felt like I could be an actual person an ordinary girl. He talked about his sister more than anything, and whenever he did, he was at his brightest, and most melancholy. The young man had been a member of a noble house, but disputes over who was the rightful heir had forced him and his sister out. Shortly after that, his sister had fallen ill and was now bedridden. I'll take anything at this point to make her better. I'll even take a miracle if I can get one. That word muttered beneath his breath sparked my memory. I was a saint. My blood had healing properties. I had no reason to hesitate. Someone needed my help and who deserved it more than this kind-hearted young man's sister. So I decided to tell him what I really was. That my blood had miraculous powers that had saved people. That the moment I had been born, the drought plaguing my village had come to an end. That I had been known as a saint and daughter of God. I told him everything and he believed it all. He led me to his house where a pale sickly young girl lay in bed. She was a sweet little girl with the same flaxen hair as her brother, who looked like she would have been quite spirited if not for her ailment. It was, a touch, it was touching to see the two siblings sitting there together, quietly holding each other. I would gladly give my blood for the two of them. And so I made a new cut on my arm, which had healed considerably thanks to the slave and the women of the brothel, and let the girl drink of my blood. Neither of them had any doubts about my sainthood, and because they believed, a miracle occurred. The flaxen haired girl recovered enough to get out of her bed. I was extremely proud of myself. I felt like, for once, I had actually saved someone's life. The only issue was, she didn't make a complete recovery. For a few days after drinking my blood, she was in good health, but her condition quick quickly regressed. I was deeply perplexed by this. 
A miracle had undoubtedly taken place, but it was only temporary. Now, though, I believe I can explain what happened. Her recovery was nothing more than a placebo effect caused by her faith. But that's something I couldn't have known at the time. We were all three perplexed and we were all three disheartened. Nevertheless, I was prepared to give her my blood as many times as needed. Whenever her condition worsened, the young man came to request more and never once did I turn him away. On the contrary, I enthusiastically offered her my services. Over time though, the hope in his eyes began to fade. He asked me on fewer walks and he seemed hesitant to look me in the eye. I assumed it was out of discomfort, out of guilt, out of shame about asking for blood. But I don't think his concerns were for me, rather himself and his sister. As I mentioned earlier, blood was considered unclean in our time. And not only was I giving mine away, I was having his sister imbibe it. Looking at it that way, it would hardly be a surprise for him or anyone else to think that I was what I was doing depraved. To think what I was doing depraved, okay. As time passed, the flaxen haired young man seemed to grow more and more disturbed by me. That was what I got for opening up. That was what I got for letting his kind, warm light shine in on me. The moment things went bad, he pulled away. There were times when I thought I shouldn't have done anything in the first place, but regardless, I held fast to my original decision. <clears throat> alright guys, I'm gonna have to end the video here for today. Thank you all for watching. We are learning the tale of the witch, and there's a pattern here. Every time she tries to do something that's considered right and just, she gets betrayed. And every time she does something like this, there's always a... Uh, what do you call? A, a negative side effect to it at that. So, I guess we're going to learn more about it in the upcoming uh, parts to come. So, with that said guys, thank you again. Until the next one.